London newsagents. This is Richard Holden, the Conservative Party chairman, standing up for, fighting for, loving, adoring his constituency of North West Durham. No, I am bloody loyal to the North East, Tom. I care about this constituency. I fought for them every day since 2019. They've never had a constituency MP who works harder. I'm up there still. He loves North West Durham so much. <laughs> he is so loyal to his constituents of North West Durham that yesterday at 4pm he announced himself as the sole candidate for, da da da, drum roll, Basildon and Billericay, about five hours' drive away from the people he's been representing since 2019. Yeah, 270 mile trip down to the heartland of Essex and a safe seat uh, where the Conservative Party chairman would have a bit of influence over who was going to be selected. It's a kind of rum affair. And it has raised eyebrows amongst his parliamentary colleagues and former parliamentary colleagues. First out of the traps with her remarks last night, Nadine Doris, and she's spoken to us today at length. Welcome to the News Agents. It's John. It's Emily. And this isn't the first time we've tried to get Nadine Dorries onto the podcast. Um, I think I might have screwed it up once with a tweet that she didn't take well to. Uh, <laughs> you, you slagged off her book. No, I didn't slag off her book. No, no, it was off be, her book. no, it was because she'd got a kind of thumbs up from David Icke. And I said, oh, that's great. Uh, and I think she thought I was being rude about her whereas maybe I was being rude about David Icke. Anyway, water under the bridge. We're friends again. So Nadine Doris has agreed to come on the podcast, answer all questions, not just about what's happening now in the Conservative Party, but what happened when Boris Johnson was leader. And we're going to talk to her at length about why she remained so loyal to somebody who squandered that majority so quickly and so badly. But we start with Richard Holden because, as John says, it is quite a rum thing. When you're party chairman, you essentially get to pick who goes where, which candidates stand where. And we understand that he left it so late that there was no one else standing on the shortlist alongside him. I mean, nobody really... For a knew. plum seat. <laughs> it's an absolute crack of a seat that he almost can't lose. He will tell you, and he has said publicly, it's because his seat, North West Durham, no longer exists. Technically, that's right. The boundaries have changed. But you know what? Other candidates have found their way around boundary changes. Nearby, <laughs> neighbouring places. Not Richard Holden. He's gone the long trek south. Yes, he is now Essex man rather than Durham man. Well, Nadine Doris, the former culture secretary, joins us now. Uh, Nadine Doris, thanks so much for being with us on the news agents. What do you make of it? Well, straight in there. <laughs> Where do I start on that one? Um, I think it's incredibly... I think it's disgusting, actually, what he's done. And... You know, we're still myself and others are still kind of like reeling from the shock of it, the audacity, the, the just the sheer audaciousness of what's taken place. But I think we have to reel back on it a bit, really, just look at what's what's happening. I think one of the reasons why Rishi may have called the election with so little notice, which, by the way, some of us actually knew in January was coming now. But I think one of the reasons why he left and did it in the way that he did was... A, because he wanted to go to the palace first, because he was very concerned that there would be a palace coup and that if he did it the correct way... When you say a palace coup, do you mean that the cabinet would have said you must be joking? Yeah, and if MPs were aware that he was about to go to the palace and call an election, I think they would have triggered the letters that they'd already lodged with Graham Brady to call a vote of no confidence and probably called it before he even got to the palace gates to stop him doing it. And I think he was very aware of that. But that there was the possibility that if he did things the, the right way around, if he went to the cabinet, got the cabinet's approval, then went to the 22 committee, which is what every former prime minister or leader does before an election, spoke to the backbenchers, then went to the palace, he wouldn't be allowed the grace to do that. And so he did things the other way around. He went to the palace first in secret, told the king so when prime when the mps began to ring graham brady and said to graham brady this is not on we want our letters triggering we want to vote no confidence graham brady said to them 
it's too late, it's already done. So I think that was one reason. I think the other reason why he left it very late with very little notice was so that he and his henchmen, the Liam Booth Smiths, James Forsyth, Richard Holtons and others, could put, insert into place in those seats that they thought they were going to win, the kind of MPs who were, they owed, they'd made promises to, because we know that promises have been getting made for a long time to MPs, had made promises to or were rewarding for various acts that they had uh, partaken in in the past recent years in the party. So there was a kind of like, a, not a surprise from some of us of what was going on. But when you get to the point where the party chairman himself, and, and I have to tell you, as people will confirm, I've been saying in private to people since the day it was called, Richard Holden will wait until hours before the nomination papers have to be in, and then he will insert himself into a constituency. And the reason for doing that is he would obviously want to avoid scrutiny. Um, I don't think he was brave enough to put himself up, even in a short list of three. And, you know, one of the things about being party chairman is the buck stops with you mm. and you lead. You lead the voluntary party. And therefore, you're supposed to set an example. You're supposed to be someone who, who goes through the process and upholds the standards and the process. And in doing what he's done, that has just been thrown to the wind. And and it's really a sad day for the Conservative Party. It's almost like it's reached the lowest point that it can. It is at, it's on the floor. When the party chairman just inserts himself into a constituency with only hours to go, giving that constituency two choices, you've got me or you've got no one, which is basically what happened, then the party's on the floor. It's it's gone. And you wonder what there is left to fight for when principles have reached such a point that they're in the gutter. I mean, I suppose if you go back to 1992 and Chris Patton fighting Bath and as party chairman and losing the seat and taking the consequence. But haven't MPs always, when a, their constituency has been scrapped, that they go and try and find a safe seat? Scrapped is a subjective word. Was it scrapped? Was it just split into two? Was there another half of the seat that he could have fought? Were there still constituents that he's been representing for quite some time that he could continue to represent? And the answer is yes. But you at least stay in your region. You know, if you're a Northwestern MP, you stay in the Northwest because that's the region you've been campaigning for and representing for a very long time. There's a difference between a chicken run and your seat being abolished and looking for a new seat. There's a difference between looking for a new seat and being inserted into a safe seat. And that's what we've seen happen here. And I'll just give you a comparison with when David Cameron was Prime Minister. I think almost, and maybe 90% of all seats were filled when David Cameron was Prime Minister two to three years before an election was called. So that's the difference. Why have they been holding on to these seats? Why have they not been filled with candidates? There's been you know, hundreds of queries from candidates and people over the past 18 months since Rishi, since Rishi Sunak became Prime Minister because the, pro it, the process was in place before he became Prime Minister asking what is going on? Why aren't the seats being filled? And the reason why they weren't being filled was they were being kept for now. And Nadine, this is early days because it only happened last night, but what effect is this having on your parliamentary colleagues? What are you sort of hearing? Oh, loads. I mean, it's, you know, the comments I've been getting from my former parliamentary colleagues have been... This is like a punch in the face to me. And that's to MPs who chose not to go on a chicken run, who have chosen to stay and represent their seats and their constituents. Like who? Can you give us some names? Red. No, I'm not going to give names. But, you know, I'm talking red wall MPs. I'm talking about the MPs who took their seats from Labour. Mm. The MPs who are almost certainly going to lose. But instead of saying, I'm going to do a chicken run, or actually most of them know they would never have been accepted anyway because, you know, they haven't done anything the party would want to reward them for. Um, they've decided to stay. It's a bit like, you know, the captain on the Titanic, isn't it? You know, he decides to jump off and jump on a passing hovercraft rather than go down with his ship. That's what Richard Holden has done. Those MPs in the North West and those Red Bull seats have chosen to stay because they're the, that's the seat they got elected for. Those voters voted them in. And they are giving those voters a democratic choice to vote them out again. Yeah. And it's them I feel for because they are feeling so demoralised and so angry. I mean, I can't repeat some of the stuff that's been said to me over the past 24 hours. They are so angry, but they would still, given the choice to run to a safe seat or to stay in your own, they would still stay in their own seat.
Oh, go on, just give us a flavour of it, because this is a podcast. We swear and do bad things on this podcast. You can tell us. No, I'm sorry, I still have whole standards. <laughs> OK, um, let me just ask you then, what do you think that this whole episode, um, the manner of the calling of the election, what Holden has done as party chairman, tells you about Rishi Sunak? It tells you everything. It's kind of like you're seeing the like the stall set out um, and, you know, it's, there's... It's not that I'm trying to think of an analogy around the emperor's clothes. It's just all there to see. And it's what it's been like since Sunak took power. It's what it was like when they removed Boris Johnson. So the party, does it deserve to win an election? No, it doesn't. A party that behaves like this, and um, which has lost all, any even semblance or pretense at having principle or standards all by abiding by due process, which is there to protect people like candidates. A party that behaves in this way doesn't really deserve to win. And I think, you know, karma, it's its just going to all come back and bite us on the bum, I think. Nadine, you're not sounding like a nailed-on Conservative voter at this point, are you? So I voted Conservative all of my life, despite the fact that I come from a Liverpool council estate, because I absolutely believe in the principles of conservatism. And I will always be a Conservative. And, you know, faced with the option of not voting, it's a hard one. So for me, it's conservative or not voting at all. So I don't know which one it's going to be yet. Let, let me just ask you, because you said um, yesterday, or at least you tweeted, that you thought that the Reform Party could overtake the Conservative, Conservative Party in the polls this weekend. Do you actually think that more people will end up voting for reform than for the Conservatives in this election? So I think there's a very strong possibility that could happen. And, you know, what, what we're seeing happening here right now is possibly the annihilation of the Conservative Party. It's probably going to disappear. And, you know, certainly if reform take over, because given tactical voting, which is taking place already in many constituencies, and given the uprising in reforms vote and support at the moment since Nigel Farage decided he would stand as leader. I think you could see the disappearance of the Conservative Party. And if I could just make this point, there was one there is one thing that, you know, even you guys would credit David Cameron and Boris Johnson for the entire time that they were leaders. They always kept an eye both to the right and to the left. So they were always aware of the dangers of a rise on the right. They, particularly David Cameron and Boris, were always watching what UKIP were doing, what UKIP were saying. And what you've seen now is because Rishi Sunak, who doesn't do politics and simply doesn't understand politics, he completely disregarded reform and UKIP. And that was political naivety. Because the one thing Boris Johnson did was he straddled the policy spectrum. He had levelling up, he had net zero, he had animal welfare on one side on the left and on the right he had Brexit and other policies always wanting tax cuts which Rishi Sunak as Chancellor would never deliver so he straddled the policy spectrum but of course Rishi Sunak came in and had none of the policy spectrum he abandoned almost every policy that was in the manifesto of 2019 and it's hard to say since Rishi Sunak became Prime Minister what what, what are we about what are our IQ policies so and, but Boris that, Johnson you know, did straddle the policy spectrum. I mean, he seemed to straddle everything. But five years ago, he landed your party, this astounding victory, and then he went on to squander it. I mean, isn't that the most shocking part of this whole conservative story? A man who had it all within his grasp, who had the electorate where he wanted it, and just through a series of scandals and disregard and lies, absolutely squandered your standing in the country. You're completely wrong, Emily, and you and I could probably argue this point for an hour or so and that you don't have the time on this podcast. And I'm not, you know, so if you want me to just give you some headline, you talked about scandals. I'm just going to give you one example because there's another point I'd like to make, actually, about the role the media played in this as well. 
And let's, let's talk about wallpaper gate. You know, the, the whole thing about there was no gold wallpaper ever. In fact, a number of journalists have had to issue apologies for having said that there was gold wallpaper. There were two sources for gold wallpaper. They both came out the same office in number 10. They were, in fact, Dominic Cummings and Lee Kane. There was no gold wallpaper. Nick Robinson had to, I think he did have an apology on Twitter for saying he'd seen it when he hadn't. It was, in fact, a red painted wall to donate the red wall sins, as sins, red okay. wall sins wins I, so I, that's just one so let's just park that a moment i, I, I hear your I wallpaper just... i just want to respond with patterson pincher partygate so many scandals the underlying theme of a man get, who thought he could get away with notes, breaking the rules okay. i I think it is. Do you want me to answer them? I do. I I just want our listeners to be reminded of how he prorogued Parliament of his disastrous early response to COVID in the care homes about lying about the Brexit benefits, lying about Partygate, dissing the Privileges Committee findings, supporting the lobbyist Owen Patterson, who's been called out by the Standards Committee, supporting a known groper. That was the man to whom you were entirely loyal, Nadine, for so long. And not alone, many in your party just stood by him whilst he trashed parliamentary standards and lied to the men and women of this country who'd given him their support. So, you know, Emily just done a great job of, you know, parroting the attacks and we will go through them one by one. But what I will say is, you know, all of those, all of those, those themes that you've just spoken about and those issues were all taken apart in my book, The Plot. OK, I tell you what, though, just let me put follow up on Partygate because it has always struck me that as a politician you've been very smart to public mood and what people accept and kind of you you're part of the anti-elite you are not kind of silver spoon in your mouth you're not Cameron and Osborne who you used to sort of depict in that way but on Partygate the people in Britain were furious and come on somehow you were saying well, it was OK. It wasn't that bad. It was just good leadership to manage your team when everyone was working so many long hours. And I just think you, I, from where I sit, you got that one wrong. I didn't. So Boris Johnson was fined, as, with, as was Rishi Sunak. Both were fined. The Met Police, the highest authority which investigated Partygate, the Met Police fined both Rishi Sunak and Boris Johnson for actually not eating a piece of cake because it never went out of the box. That was their crime at a meeting. Boris Johnson never left his desk. The people he was fined for having the cake with were the people who were coming in for the next meeting with him. And the Met Police made their finding on the basis that cake was present and therefore it took it out. Of I know, work. we can argue, yeah. Yeah, we can argue it all the way, John. Yeah. But actually, there were, Boris Johnson was absolutely unaware. Any party that you're talking about in number 10 was happened after Boris Johnson had left the building and was in checkers. They all took place on a Friday night. And by the way, there were many journalists who went in through the back doors of number 10 into those parties. They were run by the head of comms, I've spoken to the civil service who were ordered by the head of comms and the head of communications in number 10 to set out the wine glasses and the wine bottles in the vestibules. These were parties that took place with the staff in number 10 when the prime minister was in checkers, of which he had no knowledge. And in fact, the Sue Gray report says in itself he had no knowledge of those parties. And if you want to talk about the Sue Gray report, Sue Gray, who was the second permanent secretary, who walked the exact same powers corridors of power as Boris Johnson, whose job it was to ensure yeah. that correct behaviour amongst ministers and spads and civil servants and even the prime minister, that propriety and ethics of which she was the head of were met in number 10. Whatever he knew, she knew. N- Nadine, I, I don't think Sue Gray's report said that he had no knowledge of the parties, but more importantly, that report was about whether he misled Parliament. And you and other close allies put, according to the report of the Privileges Committee, improper pressure on the Privileges Committee. Improper pressure, which they say actually started to undermine the work of Parliament. Why do you want to make us like Trump's America? Why do you not want to accept the Privileges Committee's finding into a man, a Prime Minister, a former Prime Minister then, who had misled Parliament? Why is he worth dying on this hill for because you know emily if it was if i thought that the standards committee had been you know completely above board if i thought there was no impropriety in their proceedings 
if I wasn't aware that the chair of that committee and Harriet Harman had met numerous times before the committee proceedings hadn't taken place, if there was so much that I didn't know, I'd probably agree with you. I'd say this is Neil Westland. But there is a fear that that, that, that... That that could sound quite unhinged to most people, Nadine. I mean, with the greatest well, it respect, it could sound like you are not prepared to take on the parliamentary standards that MPs should all live and respect. If you can't respect the Privileges Committee, if you can't respect the Standards Committee, if you don't want to work within the rules, then honestly, what's going to become of us? What's going to become of our parliament if people like you in the middle of it can't respect it? Well, you know, Emily, you and I agree on that. And you know, if I sound unhinged in my criticism of the Standards Committee, you equally sound unhinged in just continuing going down the same road of battering what you thought was a series of events which took place at that time. And you absolutely blatantly refuse to look at any other version of events. You know, what Are I you talking about the parties? You, You're talking so about the parties with the sick on the wall? This, you know, Emily, do yourself a favour, look at the alternative side of the story, maybe not completely agree with me, but maybe be less unhinged in your own version of what you thought took place and look at some of the other facts. That so he didn't, he didn't mislead Maybe. Parliament. I, I mean, that's what I just put to you. He didn't mislead Parliament with his there, lies. Well, so, Emily, there is absolutely no evidence, and it isn't that he misled Parliament. It was the... the the committee wording was that he knowingly misled, misled Parliament. He did not mislead Parliament, and there is absolutely no evidence in the report by the committee to ascertain that he did mislead Parliament. But maybe you should read the report and see that yourself. Instead of taking the media top lines and just parroting them constantly because it suits your own particular narrative, maybe you should look at the other side of the story yeah. and perhaps be more nuanced yourself in how you present it. Nadine, let me just bring you back to Rishi Sunak, because... You were hoping you would get a peerage. It didn't happen. You resigned your seat um, when that created a number of headaches for Sunak and for the Conservative Party. What do you say to people who say, you just got peaked? You got pissed off, you were cross, and you wanted to poke Rishi Sunak in the eye? Well, there may be an element of that in there, you know, I'm not going to lie. But, you know, I wasn't <laughs> promised a peerage. It was. What Rishi Sunak did was, um, so yeah, it was quite bizarre, really. So if you want an example, Emily, of how it's very difficult to believe in the processes of Parliament today, because Rishi Sunak done, did something that hasn't been done for 400 years. HOLAC, the House of Lords Appointment Committee, said to number 10, because the process, as you know, is this very boring, last six months, if you haven't been announced on the sixth month date from the day you've been proposed, it just falls off a cliff and that's it. The process has to start again. The Appointments Committee said to Rishi Sunak, you have to tell her that she has to announce publicly that she will stand down within six months of being an MP. Rishi Sunak did not pass that information on to me. So he blocked the peerage. Did I resign in a fit of peak? I probably resigned in disgust. I reached a point of, like you've seen with Richard Holden for last night, that's just a continuation of that behaviour. And... At that point, I realised that the party was in the gutter. The Conservative Party has no standards anymore at this moment in time. There are no ethical like, barriers. People are not prepared to, to what, push even so, further so, down. Let me, so, so do you think that Boris Johnson will or should campaign in this general election? I mean, have you spoken to him recently? Yeah, I spoke to him this morning, actually. No, he was. Why, why would he do that? He's not somebody who's won two bare elections. And when he wins everything he does, every election he stands for, he wins. Why would he hitch his wagon to a sinking ship? I've mixed my analogies up there, haven't I? Yes. <laughs> Tell us what <laughs> Boris Johnson said to you this morning, because yeah, that on. is really interesting. You know, I'm not parroting to you what Boris Johnson said, but my opinion is, why would a man who's won everything he's ever stood for, the mayor, he was mayor of London twice, I'm not sure any Conservative will ever do that again. He won the Conservative Party an 80-seat majority, why would he why would he want to jump on board a sink a ship that's sinking? Why would he do that? Why would he tarnish his reputation of being a winner with campaigning for a party that is very obviously going down under mm. Rishi Sunak? He's not gonna do that. So he's not gonna campaign? Well, he would very I think I think, I believe he would really have liked to have got involved in this campaign. I think he was possibly quite concerned some time ago 
that things were going horribly wrong. And I think what he would have liked to have done is taken the fight to Labour, but there were no bullets to fire. There were no policies for him to go for. And I don't think number 10, you know, I think the message was out there quite clear. If Rishi Sunak picks up the phone to Boris Johnson, the former prime minister, he'd be happy to get involved in campaign in taking the fight to Labour. But Rishi Sunak did not want to pick up that phone because he's too proud and he doesn't get politics. And he didn't put the party first. And he doesn't understand how, when you want to win an election, you need all the talents together to do that. And Rishi Sunak t- just didn't get that. Can I just take you back to where we started, which was talking about the chicken run, essentially. Um, and I'm wondering what you'd say to those who say, you know, it's fine to slag off Richard Holden for abandoning his constituents, but you know, didn't you do the same? You kind of left mid beds to its own devices. We heard from constituents who said they hadn't seen you there for years. You were more keen on getting into the Emily, Lords. Emily, you hadn't Emily, turned up I've in the Commons. To, Emily, Go I've on. got to. I had to get lawyers involved in those comments to stop mainstream media publishing them. So please don't go there. I had to get. So the BBC started making comments that I hadn't had a surgery for a year. We, we produced the proof that my surgery, my previous surgery had been held 10 days before I stood down. So so that stuff you've seen on Twitter and that stuff that was... No, 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 this came from voters, but it's good. fine. I mean, maybe, you know, it's quite possible yeah, that the voters were wrong, but the, the impression that they no, got they was that, they were that you'd abandoned them. So, so yeah, go on, put the story straight for us. We're very happy to carry that here. My last surgery was held 10 days before I resigned as an MP. Work continued as normal. I mean, my And office, you were giving those uh, weekly, I guess, were you? My office, a fortnightly actually, on my office, once a week on Zoom, once a week in person, my office did not, full staff did not sit there doing nothing and twiddling their thumbs for a year. You know, it just, it just didn't happen. I just want to come back as well to sort of also where we started, which is about what is the state of the Conservative Party, the growth of reform. Do you think the Conservative Party, in whatever shape it comes to post-election, would be better off with Nigel Farage leading it? Oh, God. So, so, so obviously my answer is no. I'm, I'm busy thinking, where, where did you come from to get to the point where... Well, if if you th- you've you said to us the Conservative Party faces kind of, you know, it could cease to exist, in which case, presumably, what happens then is it folds into reform and who is going to be the leader of it? So the idea that Nigel Farage standing in the election means that a lot of Conservative MPs will possibly lose their seats as a result... I predicted that I think reform may have taken over Conservatives in the polling by Saturday evening when the next MRP comes out, I believe. So the fact that the man who loses the Conservative Party, most of its seats enabling its recovery to be almost impossible, should become the leader of the party it has destroyed, I think is is kind of like a fantasy it's almost unbelievable but the one thing that I've come to realize is that the things that I think are unbelievable and couldn't possibly happen do happen so you know I don't know but if I was still a conservative MP and I was standing for election now and I lost my seat because reform and Nigel Farage jumped into the ring and then someone says to me Nigel Farage is going to lead the Conservative Party. Are you OK with that? I think I'd probably have a pretty robust response to that question. What does robust mean? Well, I think I'd have a strong opinion about whether or not I still wanted to be in the Conservative Party and what I thought about Nigel Farage leading the party he'd destroyed. Nadine Doris, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate that. You're welcome. It's very complicated having a chat with Nadine Doris. And I think, I'm going to be honest, it's a long time, I think, since I've sat down and talked to her because... You start at one place and you never know quite where it's going, do you? I mean, there are, can I say rabbit holes? You do get led down very odd places and plots. I mean, her book famously was called The Plot. And there are an awful lot of sort of subplots and minor plots and and have you considered this alternative plot in any of the answers that she gives. So you're never, you're never quite sure um, where that conversation is going to end up. But there's also, I think... With Nadine Doris. I mean, look, you know, her loyalty, affection for Boris Johnson, I think, you know, does take some unpacking because it, it's hard to believe, if you've got a fair mind on any, any of this, that Boris Johnson is utterly blameless for what happened when he was Prime Minister. I mean, let's just be put it at its gentlest. He is not utterly blameless. And yet she clearly thinks that he is. 
But for all that, there is still a candour about Nadine Doris that I find really engaging. I found it engaging when she was an active frontline politician, that she would just talk and she would tell you what she thought. And there was a degree of authenticity about her, um, which, you know, some people found confounding. Some people say, oh my God, she's, you know, a conspiracy theorist or whatever. I always thought that there was something there that made her reach out beyond the normal Conservative Party base. I'm nervous about that idea of candour. I mean, definitely um, she speaks her mind and she's very easy to sort of listen to on that level. But I do think there's a worrying trend, which is people can say things directly and we credit them with telling the truth or speaking the truth. And actually, I think it is important to remember that she was one of those who was part of a coordinated campaign of interference into the work of the Privileges Committee. They said it was an attack on the legitimacy of Parliament itself for trying to undermine their work when they found Boris Johnson culpable of deliberately misleading Parliament. And I suppose you just want to be really careful that we don't automatically assume, because people are so good at, you know, whatever that weird phrase is, telling it like it is, that they are necessarily right about things because she was actually part of something that they said threatened to undermine the whole thread, really, of, of the way our democratic yeah. processes work. Yeah, I find her... One of the reasons I find her so engaging as a politician is that she's confounding because I th I sometimes think, oh my yeah. God, that is, what, that is batsh**, what you've just said. That is absolutely crazy. How can you possibly believe that? And then there are other things where you think, you know what? yeah, you've got a point there and there is something to what you say. So she's one of those politicians where you you can't believe a word she says and you can't ignore a word she yeah, says. Yeah. It's that sort of, there's something there and, and it's kind of trying was, to disentangle yeah, which is which. Yeah, she was very good. When, when I accused her of being unhinged, she said, well, you know, you might think I'm unhinged, but I think you're unhinged for believing Partygate and maybe you should go away and think about that. And honestly, Nadine, if you're still listening to this, I will go away. I will actually go away and think about whether I am unhinged um, to believe in Partygate because you've left me that challenge. Well, whilst Maitlis goes off to reflect about whether she is unhinged or not, I have no comment to make whatsoever. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow with a question and answer. See you then. Bye-bye. A Q and A. Bye-bye. Bye. The News Agents. This is a Global Player original podcast. 